All right. Well, um, it's a pleasure to give the last of my uh, three talks. It's been really nice uh, lecturing here. So today we're going to finish talking about the ADS dual to this Chern Simons matter theory, and then at the end, if there is hopefully a little bit of time, I'll tell you about this uh, some aspects of these deep brain constructions of these theories. Okay, so at the end of the last lecture, we, I had written down for you the black M2 brain solution, the black D2 brain solution, discussed how in the black D2 brain, there's no smooth near horizon limit, the type 2A coupling becomes strong in the near horizon region. It's natural to lift it to M theory, um, which does have a smooth near horizon. So, the near horizon, so, so the black D2 brain, no smooth near horizon geometry. And the type 2A coupling diverges near the horizon of the brain. So lift to M theory. And you end up with a black M2 brain solution, which has an ADS4 cross S7 near horizon geometry. So then I was going to tell you some further aspects about the field theory. So in the decoupling limit, the field theory degrees of freedom on the black D2 brain are the n equals 8 super Yang mills in, in three dimensions with the gauge group un. And this theory uh, is not conformally invariant. It has a dimension full Yang mills coupling. It becomes strongly interacting in the infrared. But it's, the RG flow of this theory is somewhat different than that of the Chen Simons Yang mills theories that we talked about in the first and second lecture. So in those Chern simons yang mills theories, in the infrared, the Yang-Mills term became an irrelevant operator, and you could just throw it away. But here, there's no Chern simons term, so if you try to throw away the Yang-Mills term, you'll throw away the whole Lagrangian. It doesn't make sense to say that. So the theory just flows to strong coupling. Um, but one can say a little bit more. So first of all, it does have a lot of supersymmetry. It has n equals 8 supersymmetry. Um, but it doesn't have the full spin 8 R symmetry of, that a conformal field theory of three dimensions with n equals 8 would have to have, and it has only a spin 7 R symmetry. This is realized geometrically. The transverse space to the D2 brain um, is seven dimensional, so it has a spin 7 R symmetry. This theory has seven real scalars, so depending how you look at it, uh, you can think of this n equals 8 theory in either, well, well, we'll talk about both in n equals 4 language and in n equals 2 language. So in n equals 4 language, it's a U1 theory with an n equals 4 vector coupled to a single adjoint hyper with n equals 4 supersymmetry. In n equals 2 language, I would say that it's an n equals 2 vector coupled to 3 adjoint chiral fields. And an n equals 2 superpotential given by Jiang Mills trace phi 1, phi 2 commutator with phi 3. So basically just the dimensional reduction of the n equals 4 theory in four dimensions. Um, right, so one, one interesting point about this field theory. Oh, so first of all, to count the seven scalars, which we, we did on uh, yesterday, but just to remind you, saying in this language, each of these has two real adjoint fields. It's a complex, uh, complex scalar, and this thing has one real adjoint in the n equals two vector multiplet that gives you a total of one plus six, which is seven. And they transform in the vector representation of the spin seven R symmetry. And it flows to strong coupling in the infrared. That is sort of the dual statement to the fact that this solution doesn't have a smooth near horizon geometry. But something is a little, uh, a little different about this theory, as I said, than the 
RG flow of the yang mills turn simon series. So first of all, in the abelian case, the, so when, when n is, so the, the U1 theory, the U1 n equals 8 super yang mills is just a free theory. Uh, all the matter is in the adjoint of U1, which means it's neutral. So it's just the seven free scalars and one free vector. And so what you should do is you should actually dualize the vector into a scalar, which you can always do in the free yang mills theory in three dimensions. So I define some scalar tau so that d tau is given by star f. And the current associated to star f, remember we said that there's always this conserved current, j is equal to star f, or in general trace of star f in the non-abelian theory, which is always conserved by the Bianchi identity. But in this n equals 8 yang mills theory, unlike the chern simons theories, this current is not a primary operator. It's a descendant of this scalar field <laughs> tau. And so in the infrared, it doesn't have to have the dimension 2 that it would have had, say, in the yang mills chern simons case. So this tau just becomes a free scalar with the ordinary canonical dimension, one half of a free scalar. And then in the infrared, you end up with a free theory with the bosonic content having eight free scalars. And then there are the associated fermions. So you just end up with the free n equals eight theory in three dimensions in the case of a single, uh, a single brain to begin with. Now, there's something kind of interesting about this. So the, when you make this lift, from the black D2 brain to the black M2 brain, you have to, so you, at each point over the black D2 brain geometry, you get an additional circle. That's the M theory circle. And asymptotically, so that is very far from the D2 brain, the space just looks like a product of the 10 dimensional space with the M theory circle. And so there's a U1 isometry which acts near infinity in this geometry, which is just the shifts just rotation on the M-theory circle, shifts in the M-theory direction. That precisely corresponds to shifts of this field tau, so shifts of this dual photon, if you like. On the other hand, if you try to, so if I just take this black D2 brain solution, just lift it to M-theory in the trivial sense, just by multiplying it by a circle, I'll get the smeared M2 brain, M2 brain which is smeared around the M theory circle, that of course also doesn't have a smooth near horizon. It's just a trivial product of this geometry with a circle. But when I say you lift it to get a black M2 brain which has this near horizon geometry, I really mean that, so here's the M theory circle, here's the, the D2 brain. The D2 brain becomes an M2 brain which is localized in this circle. And so even though at infinity I have this this, this isometry, when I get near the black M2 brain, it's localized on the circle. I don't have the smeared solution. And then near here, I have this ADS4 times S7 near horizon geometry. So the point is that the shift symmetry and the M theory circle is broken when you go to this description. And that corresponds to the fact that in this field theory, this current is not uh, a primary operator. So in, in the infrared theory, the v the origin of moduli space is, say, tau equals zero, uh, which is not invariant under the shift symmetry. Okay, so this sort of explains why the black D2 brain doesn't have a smooth near horizon and the black M2 brain does from the field theory point of view. Okay, um, now this, the infrared limit of this N equals eight super Yang mills with gauge group UN appears to have no adjustable coupling constant. I mean, this G A mills is dimensionful. In the infrared, it's not a parameter of the theory. And if you talk about M2 brains in flat space, there also appears to be no adjustable coupling. There's no coupling parameter in, in M theory. So people thought for a long time that there just was no Lagrangian description of the infrared limit of the conformal field theory living on these brains. Um, you Right, I mean, it's, it's also clear that the, the UN gauge fields on the D2 brain are, aren't the right degrees of freedom in the infrared, precisely because of this argument. Even in the abelian case, you don't end up with gauge fields in the infrared theory which have 
dimension one, you end up dualizing to this scalar with dimension half. So something somehow analogous must happen in the non-abelian theory, but you don't know how to dualize the non-abelian gauge field, so I can't write such a simple formula. But it's clear that you don't have the original gauge fields in the infrared. Um, okay, but on the other hand, you have this nice supergravity solution with a near, smooth near horizon, ADS4 times S7, and if you assume ADS CFT, then you can read off various properties that the theory must have. So the number of degrees of freedom, so beta F of the thermal theory, where beta is the inverse temperature, goes like the two-dimensional volume of space times the temperature squared by dimensional analog an analysis. So that's analogous to the V3 T cubed of the n equals 4 theory in four dimensions that uh, Juan talked about multiplied by some number, which is just the appropriate counting of the volume of the space. Uh, so this thing, in this theory, goes like n to the 3 halves power, which is a very famous and surprising scaling of the number of degrees of freedom. It doesn't look anything like a gauge theory with n, de n squared degrees of freedom. And it's also somewhere in between a gauge theory with n squared degrees of freedom and just n free particles with only n degrees of freedom. And then you can also analyze the spectrum of uh, kaluza klein modes and fluctuations on this uh, seventh sphere, harmonics on the seventh sphere. Uh, the harmonics on the seventh sphere end up giving you operators which have dimensions delta, which is k over two for k equals two, three, and so on. Um, that are in the completely symmetric representation, so the, the sort of case symmetric representation of the S08 isometry of the S7. So from the gravity side, you know, these things that must be properties of the infrared theory. Oops. Um, Right, so the conformal symmetry, so the one, one aspect, obviously the conformal symmetry of the theory is not manifest in this description, but in, in principle, it does define the theory on M2 brain, so if you put this on the lattice, maybe, I mean, it would be difficult to practice, but in principle, since it gives you the theory in the UV, it flows to something. Um, and you can also determine the, right, f from this you would guess that the moduli space is the nth symmetric product of R8, if you like. So it's just n objects probing R8. You can even, in a sense, see this from the field here if I go out onto the moduli space. I'll have this kind of. So if I go out onto the moduli space of the n equals 8 field theory, then in general I'll completely break the gauge group to diagonal uh, pieces, and each of the diagonal unbroken U1s I dualize in a trivial way, and I'll end up with these eight scalars and I'll have n, n of them. On the other hand, it, you can't easily construct half BPS operators. So if you start in this description, the n equals eight super Yang mills, you can't construct the half BPS primary operators in, in a nice way for a very particular reason. So this is precisely a situation in which the R symmetry in the UV and the infrared are, are not the same. E even the n equals four R symmetry. So let me erase this. I hope if you wanted to write it down, you already wrote it down. So here in the UV description, you have an SU2 times SU2 R symmetry associated to the fact that it's an N equals four theory in three dimensions. And if you look at how the matter content of this theory sits under this, just to make it simple, I'll just talk about the scalars. So the scalars of this theory, so the dual photon that I just erased, this guy tau, is of course in the trivial representation. And then you have the three scalars that sit in the n equals four vector multiplet that are in the one three representation. And then you have the scalars that sit in this adjoint hypermultiplet, which sit in the two two representation uh, as usual. So remember that hypermultiplets consisted of two conjugate chiral multiplets, if I think in n equals two notation, and they're rotated by in the two of the SU2 of this n equals four theory. So the scalars sit in these representations, but on the other hand, 
in the infrared, we were just ended up with the free theory of eight scalars and the natural embedding of of the spin four infrared R symmetry, which is the R symmetry in the infrared which controls the dimensions of operators uh, inside of the spin eight R symmetry in the infrared theory tells you that, so here you just had eight free scalars which transformed in the spinner representation of spin eight, and here they just decompose into two copies of the, um, Here they just compose into, so if I wrote this thing, it's also SU2 times SU2, and this decomposes into just two copies of the 2-2 two, two representation, I mean the sort of left and right-handed copies. So this content, this content is completely different, and the way that this is possible, even though the R symmetry is a non-abelian group, is that it sits inside of a bigger non-abelian group, and of course you can, in a sense, rotate from one non-abelian group to another if they both sit inside of a, of a bigger group. So this, uh, this R symmetry, the R symmetry in the infrared, which sits in the same, I mean, which sits in the n equals four multiplet together with the conformal transformations, so that the R charges under this R symmetry are associated to the dimensions of operators, is not even a symmetry of the UV theory. It doesn't, it sits inside of the full spin eight, but not in this spin seven subgroup that is manifest in the UV theory. And that's, even true for the n equals two case, so there it's kind of more, more trivial almost. Um, the matter content, there, there are two guys that are neutral under, uncharged under the U1R symmetry in the, in the UV, namely the dual photon and the scalar sitting in the n equals two vector, and then there are six guys that have to have R charge two thirds, because the total R charge of the superpotential in three dimensions has to be two, and there are three fields. And so there are six guys with charge two-thirds and two guys with charge zero. But on the other hand, in the infrared, again, you just have this free theory with uh, eight scalars. So in the n equals two language, you just get a total of, of four, uh, four chiral multiplets. They have the canonical dimension half, so you have eight, eight real fields with dimension one half. So these, again, completely different content. And it's, it's obvious that just because one of the scalars in the infrared is the dual photon, that this R symmetry isn't even contained in the spin seven R symmetry, under which, of course, the dual photon is neutral. So this is why you can't construct the collection of half BPS operators starting with the N equals eight theory, even though in principle, it completely defines the, the physics uh, you define the theory in the UV, you should flow to something, and, right. Okay, so, but as we talked about, there's this N equals six Chern Simons matter theory, and this theory, uh, let's say in the, the case, the simplest case, we'll look at the UN times UN theory at levels one and minus one. So here I'm writing it in N equals two language. So. This theory is claimed now to be the infrared limit of this n equals eight super Yang male. So this is a conf super conformal theory, but not all the supersymmetry is manifest. It only has n equals six supersymmetry. You don't see the, the full n equals eight. Of course, it has super conformal symmetry, so it actually has 12 uh, supercharges, which is more than the eight, but they're a, diff they're a, different, they're a different set of them. So there are some supersymmetries that you can see in that description that are not manifest in this description. But the claim, if this is indeed the infrared limit of this theory, is that if you look at this Chern-Simons matter theory when the Chern-Simons levels are, are in particular one and minus one, that, so that's in a strong coupling limit of this class of Chern-Simons theories. Remember, the effective coupling is like one over the level k, so when k is one, it's very strongly coupled. So the claim is that supersymmetry is enhanced to n equals eight non-perturbatively, but you don't see it manifestly in the Lagrangian of the theory. So why would this Lagrangian exist after I tried to convince you that there shouldn't be a Lagrangian for M2 brains? Um, so the best way I think to understand that is that there, so okay, so if I put 
the trend Simons level here to be k, it's no longer the same as the infrared limit of this theory, something, some generalization of it. And if k is a big number, this is a weakly coupled theory. So why should there be any weakly coupled theories associated to M2 brain? So the point is that there, there is actually just some background, namely uh, some very narrow cone, if you like, which is just the cone C4 mod ZK, where on the coordinates C4, let's say there's Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, this ZK acts by omega, omega inverse, omega, omega inverse, where omega to the K is, is one, so by rotations by the kth roots of unity on the coordinates. So this defines some kind of narrow cone when k is a big number. And this is just some background in which nm2 brands, when n is much less than k, is a weakly coupled theory. So that's why it ends up having a Lagrangian. And one way to understand why you end up in this limit with a weakly coupled field theory is that, so this action of zk basically makes some circle this cone has some very small circle, which I'll describe explicitly in a minute. And when that circle becomes very small, it's natural to reduce the whole picture back to type to a string theory. So if I have a small circle in M theory, I want to reduce to type 2A, and I'll end up with type 2A at weak coupling. And so if I have NM2 brains in this background when K is much bigger than N, then it's just some D2 brains in at the tip of a seven-dimensional cone and the type 2A coupling is weak, so it's not surprising that it's described by some weakly coupled gauge theory. So that's the logic. And then in, but K is a discrete parameter, just like the trans Hyman's level, and when you set K equals one, you don't make the quotient at all, and then you're supposed to end up with the infrared limit of the strongly coupled theory of M2 brains in flat space. Right, so th this, doesn't have, this doesn't have n equals eight supersymmetry. So if k is not one or two, it doesn't have n equals eight. And if k is one or two, then it's believed that it's enhanced to n equals eight non-perturbatively, in, in a way that I'll describe in, more clearly in a, in a little bit. But yeah, I mean, if k is not one or two, this orbifold itself doesn't have n equals eight supersymmetry, it only has n equals six, so you wouldn't expect n equals eight. So that's the price you pay. So if you, you want to find a background in which M2 brains are weakly coupled, you can't do it preserving the full n equals eight supersymmetry. So you pay a price and then you can write a background where they will become weakly coupled. But n equals six is not so small, so. Okay, so we talked a little bit about the analysis of the modulized basis of trans Simons matter theories. We actually talked about an example with half the number of matter fields, which has modulized space C2 mod ZK. But it's very easy to convince yourself that this theory has a modulized space that's given by sim n of C4 mod ZK. So let me just sketch how it works. So the potential, the, the superpotential in this theory is like the klebanov witten superpotential. If I call these fields A1 and A2 and B1 and B2, then the superpotential is something like this. And it's kind of obvious that if you take, so these are by fundamental matrices, so it doesn't mean anything to diagonalize them in the usual sense, but if you literally take them to be matrices with only elements on the diagonal, it's obvious that you satisfy the F-term equations. And on such a branch of the moduli space, when otherwise all of the VEVs of these fields are arbitrary, you break the gauge groups down to the diagonal parts and then you just get n copies of the U1 cross U1 theory. And in the U1 cross U1 theory, by similar arguments to the case with half the matter content, the only effect of the trans Simons level is the CK quotient. And so you end up with this uh, theory with a moduli space given by this. So this is. And that's indeed the expected moduli space of n M2 brains in this orbifold. So you just put and objects in here, and of course they're, they're identical, that's why you quotient by the symmetric group with n elements. Okay, so let's describe a little bit more carefully the geometry of this cone. So, the, so, so this thing is, this is the, 
the calm, I mean the, the real calm over S7 mod ZK. And S, so S7 is just the horizon or just the unit sphere in C4. So, so this is S7. And S7 mod ZK is this thing quotiented by this discrete symmetry. Now, if you allow k to be extremely large, you could almost treat this variable omega as a continuous u1 variable because it's a kth root of unity, but if I take you know, omega to the n and n over k, so, right. So, I mean, this is multiplication by e to the 2 pi i over k, and if I do it n times, I'll have e to the 2 pi i n over k. So, if k is a huge number, then this is basically just a continuous phase. And in that case, it's like I'm quotienting by a whole u1, which acts with charges 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1. And that will reduce this geometry to the cone. So in a sense, the k equals infinity limit is now a seven-dimensional geometry. Instead of an eight-dimensional geometry, you shrink this circle all the way. And it looks like the... the real cone over CP3. CP3 is the three-dimensional projective space, which is defined by modding out by this U1. So you take C4, you quotient by that U1, and then you also impose an equation that says Z1 squared plus Z3 squared minus Z2 squared minus Z4 squared is, sorry. is equal to one. Okay, so that's CP3, so that's exactly this, this horizon equation together with this quotient. So it's the real cone over CP3. Yes? Uh, I'm confused about something. You get CP by modding out by diagonal. So, I mean, you can just think of that as some change of coordinates. It doesn't, I, I could have written Z2 star if you want. Um, the, Th that's true. I mean, I, I think it's better to think that the quotient is this because usually, so the point is that C4 has a whole SO8R symmetry. So if you start talking about C4, if you think about it as C4, then you've really already imagined that you, you split the isometry group into U1 cross SU4. So not all of the <coughs> rotational symmetry of R8 is manifest in your description when you call it C4, precisely because you are distinguishing between Zs and Z stars. So th that's why you could, yeah. So both of them would be supersymmetric. It, it makes no difference because of that. But if you want to think of it as C4 mod ZK, it's more natural to have one where the, the R charge is sum to zero, if you like. So it, this thing would still preserve supersymmetry. And then it sounds a little bit funny. So it's like CP3 with a funny complex structure. I mean, it's like CP3 where I wrote it in coordinates where it's not manifest that it's a complex manifold. Okay, so right. So th this this background in which M two brains is, are weakly coupled is associated to a different reduction to type two A. I can now imagine reducing to type two A along the U one isometry, which contains this zk. And in the near horizon limit, I have here ADS four times a seven mod zk and I can imagine reducing to type 2a along the u1 isometry of the S7, which contains this CK. So I'm gonna write down, oh, yes? Oh, sorry. So I'm gonna write down more explicitly the metric on, on S7, it's pretty obvious, but, which is associated to this reduction. So metric on S7 mod ZK, I can rewrite it as in the following way. So I use the variable phi a little too often. I should call it something else, but uh, maybe I'll call it psi. I, so psi is often a fermion, but I use it a little bit less often than phi. So. 
So here I'm writing F7 mod ZK as a circle vibration over CP3. So this psi is some angular variable on the circle and Right, so this thing, omega, is some one form on CP3, which tells you how the circle is fibered over the base. Um, and this phi is the coordinate on the circle, psi is the coordinate on the circle. The metric on CP3 is given by, as usual, minus where this thing rho is just the sum of the zi squared. And d omega is the Keller form on CP3, i times maybe I'll write it like this, kind of weird notation, but you know what I mean, this thing wedge product with the conjugate. So, Okay, so this is the metric on S7 mod ZK. I write it as a circle vibration over CP3, but the circle is non-trivially fibered. It has some curvature. The curvature is encoded in this field strength J, which is just proportional to the Keller form on CP3. So CP3 has only one, one, uh, one Keller form, so it had to be proportional to it. And there's some coefficient uh, K. So I guess I should have written K here. I think that gives me the case in the right places. Okay, so right, so so this is the this is the geometry that I have, and I can now reduce in the usual way from M theory to type two A theory along the U1 isometry associated to the coordinate psi. Now, because the circle has a non-trivial is non-trivially fibered, when I do that in type two A, I'll end up with F2 flux in the usual dictionary of reduction from M theory to type 2A. So let me just remind you uh, how that goes. Uh, an another comment which is kind of important in this business is that here, the, this U1 isometry extends to the entire black M2 brain solution. So it's, as we saw here, it's a solution of the near horizon geometry. It's actually a solution of the entire black M2 brain solution. And this is in, in contrast to the usual U1 associated of, to the lift of the D2 brain to the M2 brain, which as I said, is only an isometry of the asymptotic space. It's not an, iso an isometry of the near horizon region because the black M2 brain is localized on the circle, where, whereas the D2 brain is, is in a sense the smeared object. But this U1 is an isometry of the whole solution, so if you have a, if I start with the black M2 brain solution and this funny space, and I reduce on that circle, I'll end up with the black D2 brain solution in some funny background. It won't be a purely geometrical background, because as I said, you'll generate in the background F2 flux because of this curvature, and the, the value of the dilaton, which is associated to the, to the size of this circle will be varying. In particular, in the background itself, it goes to zero at the origin. So if you found a background here in which the black M2, M2, in which the M2 brain theory, when K is large, becomes weakly coupled, it also corresponds to a black D2 brain supergravity solution, which does have a smooth near horizon limit. The fact that in the background, the dilaton, I mean, the, the type 2A coupling, goes to zero at the origin, in some sense, cancels its divergence in the black D2 solution in flat space, and so you end up with a smooth near horizon, which is just the quotient of this on the circle. It's just ADS4 times CP3. 
So anyway, so in, as usual, when you relate type 2a theory to m theory, the 11 dimensional metric is given by the 10 dimensional metric in this way. Uh, phi here is the dilaton, and then there's some F2 flux in type 2a, which in our case is given by k times the Keller form on CP3. In general, the F2 flux is just the flux associated to this guy a. So a is the Raman Raman uh, one form potential in type 2a theory. Okay, so this is the relation between the M theory and type 2a geometries. The, the radius of the 11 circle, the M theory circle, is given by um, so, it, it, so what the radius of the 11 circle in the near horizon limit in, in ADS4 times S7 mod ZK. So in the near horizon limit, the size of the circle is constant. In the black brain solution, it, it varies spatially, but it approaches a constant in the, in the near horizon. It doesn't vary on the CP3. That's partly because you have this huge uh, SO6 isometry of the geometry. If you looked at more complicated backgrounds, that wouldn't be true. Um, so the radius of the 11th circle in the near horizon geometry is given by R k over LP, where R will appear in a, f a formula that I'll write in one minute, um, which goes like n times k to the one-sixth over k. So you can see, well, why don't I, I don't know. So the radius of the M-theory circle depends on n and k in that manner. And so there are different regimes. So if k to the fifth power is much, much less than n. So if n is very, very large, so this is a scaling different than the usual Atuf scaling of gauge theory. So remember we had this un times un gauge theory. The effective coupling of the gauge theory was one over k. So if you wanted to define an Atuf coupling of the gauge theory, it would be n over k. So I'll, I'll write that in a second. Um, so if I'm in this other regime, when n is much bigger than k to the fifth, then you see that M theory is a good description. Right. In this geometry, when this thing is the same as N over K to the fifth to the one sixth power, obviously. So if N is much bigger than K to the fifth, then that circle is large, and M theory supergravity, 11 dimensional supergravity, is a good description. On the other hand, if K to the fifth is much bigger than N, but N is still much bigger than K, then Type 2a supergravity is a good description. Um, and in the field theory, the usual Latouf coupling would be given by lambda equal to n times 1 over k, so n over k. So the Latouf regime is the one where n over k is a fixed number, a fixed large number, and then you take n to infinity and also k to infinity with the same scaling. So this is not in that regime. It's n much bigger than k to some higher power. So unsurprisingly, the claim is that this gauge theory in the Atuf limit looks like string theory. It's only in some other limit, namely when you keep the original gauge couplings fixed and just take the rank to be huge, or something more subtle with these powers. I mean, one way to do this is just take k fixed and take n to infinity. And that will produce M theory in a fixed background, which is defined by S7 mod ZK. So if you want the M theory geometry, you want to keep K fixed. You want to have S7 mod ZK for a particular K. And then you just take the rank to infinity. So it's some sort of, in terms of the Atof picture, it's infinite lambda. I mean, you're scaling lambda together with N. So it's a different limit, and that produces this M theory dual. The usual Atof limit is, is a string theory dual. And the geometry you get from dimensional reduction of this ADS4 times S7 mod ZK to type 2A theory using the usual, uh, usual reduction is given by, so we already wrote the M theory geometry, which after all it's just ADS4 times S7. In type 2A theory you have ADS4 times CP3, 
Um, you have the type 2a coupling given by the formula I wrote there. The, there's some four form flux in type 2a, which fills the ADS4. So this epsilon 4 is just the completely anti symmetric, uh, I mean, unit 4 form in ADS4. And then there's also this F2 flux, which wraps the CP3. And the string radius is given by this same constant R cubed over K, which is 2 to the 5 halves pi square root of N over K. So th th this R is just some convenient constant that we define that you could define by this formula. So the string radius goes like lambda to the one quarter. That's actually the same scaling as in n equals 4 yang Rills. But you see that the dilaton has a different behavior. In the n equals, in ADS5, the type 2b coupling actually goes like j no squared, if you like, or you could also write it as <coughs> n over lambda. I mean, lambda over n. So in, so in the n equals 4 super yang Rills in, in 4D, then the, the type 2b coupling scales like 1 over n times lambda, and the string radius goes like lambda to the 1 quarter. Here we also have lambda to the 1 quarter, but the type 2a coupling goes like this funny number. So you can write this thing as uh, 1 over n times lambda to the, well, this is the square of the string coupling. So g type 2a scales like uh, n to the 1 quarter over k to the 1 to the 5 quarters, which is the same thing as 1 over n times lambda to the 5 quarters. So it's a different scaling than there by this factor of lambda to the 1 quarter. Because of that, and if you look in this formula, if you keep k fixed and send n to infinity, the type 2a coupling gets stronger and stronger which is natural because in that regime you should be lifting to M theory. Ah, good question. So yeah, I was, I was getting to that in, in one second. So this gives you, in a sense, a different point of view on the factor of N to the three halves. So if I have NM two brains in this orbifold, this C4 mod ZK, then the number of degrees of freedom, so, so beta f, you would think, goes like, so first of all, in the covering space, so if I don't quotient, so if I have n m2 brains in C4 mod zk, it's like I started with k times n m2 brains in C4. So I have k times n to the 3 halves power divided by k because I quotient by the zk. And this thing is equal to n to the 3 quarters divided um, times lambda to the 1 half. But I can rewrite that, of course, in a trivial way, n squared divided by the square root of lambda. And so from this point of view, you would say that the number of degrees of freedom of M2 brains does match that of a gauge theory in some sense. It has the n squared. It just suppressed that large lambda by 1 over the square root of lambda. Actually, very recently, there's a beautiful calculation uh, by, I'm not going to remember <laughs> Drucker, Mourinho, and, and Petrov, who, who calculated this uh, suppression by 1 over the square root of lambda uh, for the partition function of the theory on S3. So that's quite amazing that they actually see this suppression directly from the field theory. So from supergravity, it's easy to read this off, but for them to see from the field theory is amazing. So anyway, at, at weak coupling, the scaling is, of course, completely different. You don't have the 1 over square root of lambda at weak coupling. Um, you just have the usual number of degrees of freedom of a large n-gauge theory. So weak coupling, you get minus n squared. And then just uh, some number that I won't explain. 
and then some corrections starting with order lambda. So this is when lambda is much, much less than one. And then the M-theory regime is when lambda is of order n, or at least when k fifth is less than n. Um, yeah, that's probably true. Uh, yeah. Yeah, of course. So this is a good point. So in, in these Chern Simons theories, usually there's no one loop correction to many quantities because the Chern Simons theorem is parity odd. So you don't think you'll ever generate corrections that go like k itself because the theory with k and minus k are related by parity. So the sign of the term wouldn't be determined. I guess you can't exactly apply that argument here because you have two gauge groups with levels k and minus k. So under parity, you send one to minus the other one, but the theory looks the same. But if you just work it out in terms of perturbative graphs, you'll also see the same fact. So Igor is right, and it starts at k lambda squared. OK, um, so one other thing to, to note about this is that in, in the tough limit, we can ignore these uh, monopole operators that we talked about uh, yesterday, because their dimensions. So remember, the, the monopole operator was a, something which had at minimum one unit of magnetic flux. And when you have these Chern Simons terms, in this case, that will mean that it carries k units of the electric charge. And so to make a gauge invariant object involving the monopole charge, so a gauge invariant object with some magnetic flux, you must have k matter excitations at least also turned on in order to make it electrically neutral. So its dimension will grow at least with k. And so in the Tuff limit, when you take k to infinity, those objects are extremely, have extremely high dimensions. They don't look like low-lying modes in the supergravity description. So the theory in the hype 2 a dual in ADS4 times CP3 is basically dual to the field theory without the monopoles, in a sense. And indeed, if you went back to the analysis of the moduli space, in order to see that you have C4 mod ZK instead of C4 quotient by U1, in other words, why, why was it that you only quotiented by this ZK subgroup of the constant gauge transformations? It was crucial that the chern simons term wasn't gauge invariant under arbitrary gauge transformations, arbitrary constant gauge transformations, because of you could have configurations with non-trivial flux. And so if you decouple those objects, or equivalently take k to infinity, zk basically becomes u1, then in a sense the moduli space of the field theory without thinking about the monopole operators is the real cone over CP3, which matches what you expect for this type 2a background. But in order to see the lift to m theory, it's crucial to take into account those monopole operators. Well, another thing which in a sense, c convinces you that this field theory is, 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 in a, is, is really a field theory describing M2 brains and not, not just D2 brains, is that the chern simons theories have, have sextic potentials. The bosonic potential in the chern simons matter theory is sextic and not chordic, as it would be in the Yang-Mills theory. And so if you go, if you pull one of the objects away from the origin, so if you say, take one of the matter fields, say, B1, to be given by, you know, V000, where, you know, <clears throat> V is just the sum parameter onto the moduli space, so I pull one of the M2 brains away from the origin, then in, in the geometry, I mean, just by, to correct for dimensions, it's like I pulled it away some distance, L Planck, to the three halves times V, I mean, just because this field has dimension half and uh, distance has dimension minus one, so I have to correct it in this way, then the mass of the off-diagonal modes, mass of off-diagonal modes, namely the parts of the gauge group which are broken, I mean the, the fields which is, connect this V to here. I mean, you might have called them the strings connecting the brains, but here they're M2 brains, so it's not strings. Uh, so these guys have some mass, which just comes from the fact that the potential is sextic, which is 
quadratic in this v, v. So it's something order one over k times v squared, which I can rewrite as r squared over k l Planck to the minus three. So r is the physical distance that I've moved the M2 brain away from the origin. And this thing looks like the area of a cone, I mean, rather than a distance. So if I did this in Yang-Mills theory, I would have had something linear in R, and I would have said, oh, it's like the mass of a string stretched between the two brains. Here, I get something that grows quadratically with the distance. So it's like another M2 brain that's stretched between the two brains. So it gives the appropriate scaling that you'd expect from a theory of M2 brains. Um, an another thing to point out is that on the moduli space of this theory, if you go out onto the moduli space without breaking the diagonal U1, so not, not on the moduli space like this, but if I take uh, the matrices, you know, say B1 is equal to some number times the identity matrix, for instance, then I'll, of course, break the relative UN, but I don't break an overall UN, so I still preserve a, a UN gauge symmetry. And you can work out that on the moduli space, with this val, on that branch of the moduli space, that's like I pull all of the M2 brains together, still on top of each other, but away from the singularity at the tip of the cone, that if I integrate out the gauge fields that got Higgs, I generate the Yang-Mills kinetic term for the unbroken gauge fields. So I end up back with exactly the n equals eight super Yang-Mills. So, so I end up with the n equals eight UN super Yang-Mills, at least at, scale, at energies below some scale given roughly by G Yang-Mills squared times K. So that makes perfect sense. If I have these M2 brains on this cone geometry, if they sit at the cone point, I get this nice conformal field theory. If I pull them away, I get the, my old friend, the n equals eight super Yang Mills, because when the M2 brains are very far from the tip of the cone, it's basically like M2 brains in flat space. And I, you can actually see that that's reproduced. Okay, so this gives you various reasons to think that this is the correct theory. Um, now, let's see, how am I doing? Okay, so I'm gonna finish the cover of that. Or that. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about matchings of operators. So let me move that board away. So I'm gonna describe to you how you can map various uh, half BPS operators. Oops, sorry half BPS operators of the field theory to molds and various brains in the type 2A picture. So this will give you further evidence of this duality. Um, so, so first of all, one, one, one basic point, which I won't work out for you because it's not time, is that if you look at type 2A theory on this ADS4 times CP3, there's, you, you might have thought there are many Ramon Ramon gauge fields in ADS4, which I get by taking the various P form potentials and putting their legs on CP3. But, so, so some of them are dual by electromagnetic duality. So the one, is, the one under which D0 brains are charged is the magnetic dual of the one under which D6 brains are charged, and likewise for D2 and D4. And I can take any of those brains and wrap them completely in the CP3 so that they look point-like in ADS4. So the associated, uh, there's an associated gauge field in ADS4. So you might have thought there were two Ramon Ramon gauge fields and their electromagnetic duals in ADS4, but one combination is Higgs. And so the so in type 2A, the, the massless combination, so one of them is Higgs and becomes massive. The massless uh, Ramon Ramon gauge field is a particular combination of, of two of them, is the one. Uh, under which the charge is given by K times the D0 brain charge, Q0, plus N times the D4 brain charge. Okay, so you can just work this out by analyzing the supergravity equations of motion and the ADS4 times CP3 background, but we don't have time to do that. So 
under, so this is the guy which should be identified with the U1 associated to the M-theory isometry. So in M-theory, there's this U1 isometry that we reduce down. In type 2A, it's realized by this Ramon Ramon uh, gauge field. So that's the associated charge. And in the field theory, that will map to the, the monopole charge, the, the, num the amount of magnetic flux. So just to give you a quick taste, um, there are various single trace operators that are very analogous to what happens in n equals four Yang Mills. So in in n equals two language, if I just forget about the n equals six supersymmetry for a second, just think about it as an n equals two field theory with that uh, matter content, then I can obviously take operators of this form with copies of A's and B's. But of course, A and B are in the bifundamentals, so I always have to have the pattern A, B, A, B. Otherwise, it wouldn't be gauge invariant. And if I take, say, L of these, then I have an operator whose dimension. So, so I didn't say it again, but it should be obvious, because the theory has n equals 6, which is in particular n equals 3, that the dimensions of all of the operators are given by the canonical dimensions. So these guys have dimension 1 half, and R charge 1 half. So this thing has dimension a half times L times two because they're L pairs. So it has dimension L. Um, and you have to, so these are the, these A and B are the S2 cross S2 flavor indices, just like in the picture there. And you have to contract them symmetrically. So A, B, C are contracted symmetrically and A dot, B dot, C dot also symmetrically. The anti-symmetric combinations aren't uh, half BPS primary operators because of the superpotential relation. So for, I don't have time to explain why that's the case, but for those of you who know, if you write the equations dw equals zero, any operator, any part of an operator which is associated to one of the equations dw equals zero won't be a, a primary operator at some descendant. So, if you want to write down only the half BPS primaries, you have to take these in symmetric contractions. Um, of course, there's actually the full SU4R symmetry. And so there are more operators than just these. If you combine the fields A and B together into the four of SU4, so I can define some C, which is, contains all four of the A's and B's, so A1, a2, B1, dagger, B2, dagger. So that lives in the four of SU4. Then I can form similar contractions with C and C dagger. I mean, something like CI, CI dot dagger, CJ, CJ dot dagger, dot, dot, dot. And again, I have to contract these indices together symmetrically and these four bar indices together symmetrically, um, and I'll get some half PPS primary operator of that form. And then there are also these monopole operators. The, uh, as we said many times, the monopole operator you can basically regard as, well, so the, when, when you try to attach some magnetic flux, you end up, because of the chern simons term, having an object which carries charges under the gauge group. And so you have to form gauge invariant combinations of those magnetic objects with the original matter fields. So <clears throat> if I imagine I have an object, so I construct an operator in the radial quantization on S2 cross R, and I imagine that it has magnetic fluxes. So the integral on S2 of F1 in the first gauge group should equal for the second gauge group. Um, so this we, the reason for this relation is the same as what, how we, what we explained yesterday. 
Basically, it's by the equations of motion for the gauge field. There's nothing charged under the diagonal combination of the gauge charge. So you have to satisfy this, and then you can take this flux to be, say, 2 pi times some matrix. I mean, could be some integers, n1 through nn. And then you'll, this will create some, some monopole operator. I'll call it, say, this is just some notation. This is a guy which transforms in a representation of the gauge group due to the John Simons term, which is a representation of with weight vector k times these n's under the first one and minus k times these n's under the second u1. And so I have to combine it with appropriate contractions with the fields a and b. And of course, as before, I can re should really use the full SU4 R symmetry, and so I can combine it with these Cs, which are the things combined together into the representations of the full R symmetry. Well, here I want to take an operator where they're actually just equal, I mean, as, as matrices. So there, there, could, there, could be, there could be operators where this and this are not equal, but the traces are equal. But I think they're associated with higher spin objects. So I just want to talk about the simplest, the simplest model. So yeah, I mean, you can just say I'm choosing this equation. It's, it's, not, it's not the only possible choice of fluxes. It's clear that the traces have to be equal, because otherwise, for instance, the object could never be made gauge invariant. There's also other ways to see that the traces have to be equal from the supersymmetry equations. OK, and so these, these operators match very nicely with the spectrum of the theory uh, on the gravity side. So in supergravity on ADS4 times S7 mod ZK, you have various harmonics on the sphere. And so, as, as I told you before, the modes here are things which are in Lth symmetric products of the eight-dimensional vector representation of the SO8 isometry of S7. So this is without the ZK. And now I make this ZK quotient. So I break this thing down to SU4 cross U1. This U1 is the monopole charge U1. This is the R symmetry of in the ADS4 times CP3. And then I decompose this representation, and this eight-dimensional vector representation decomposes into the 4 plus 4 bar under, with charge 1 and minus 1 under this group. And so then you can see that the kinds of uh, guys you get in this L symmetric product exactly match those. So if I combine together equal numbers of 4s and 4 bars, in which these are symmetrically contracted and those are symmetrically contracted, I get something with no monopole charge, and that matches these. Or I can do something like, say, contracting together a bunch of fours, which will give me something with some non-zero monopole charge. And then I'll end up with, with these operators. Um, because I quotient by ZK, I'm only allowed to have guys whose total charge under this UNB is a multiple of K. That's what it means to quotient by ZK. ZK is a, a ZK subgroup inside of this U1, and so the things that are invariant under ZK are the ones which have charge K so that they don't transform. So, so, so the ZK invariant spectrum matches. So I have very little time left. Um, so I had, so I could also tell you about matching of other brains. Uh, so I had promised, or had hoped to promise, that I would tell you a little bit about these brain constructions. Um, not sure if I have much time to say anything that meaningful about it, but I'll just give you the small flavor of that. So. The idea is the following. Um, 
So we talked about how you have this background, the C4 mod ZK background, in which NM2 brains will become weakly coupled when K is very large. But that doesn't immediately allow us to read off the field theory living on the M2 brains, which is what we want to do, I mean, in order to show that this is the correct answer. So one problem with, ADS, with C4 mod ZK is that the size of the M theory circle, although it becomes smaller when K is large, is linear in the radius. So it goes to zero at the origin, which is good, but out of infinity, it gets infinitely large. So the background I get by reducing, so if I take C4 mod ZK and I reduce to, to type 2A on the U1, which contains this ZK, I get this real calm over CP3, but and G type 2A goes to zero at, well, type 2A coupling is proportional to the radius R in this real column. So as you go out to infinity, the type 2A coupling blows up. So that's not the nicest possible background, but you can modify that. So instead of talking about the background C4 mod ZK, you can replace it with a somewhat more complicated background which has the virtue of having that circle small, even at uh, R goes to infinity. So this background has less supersymmetry, so it's some background with n equals three. So C4 mod ZK preserves n equals six supersymmetry. This background has n equals three. So this is just a background in M theory. I haven't put in the M2 brains yet. And it's of the form R21 times some complicated manifold, something special case of a toric uh, hyperkeller manifold. But a toric hyperkeller manifold, a hyperkeller, well, I could say eight manifold. But this particular toric hyperkeller eight manifold, and it's some kind of generalization of the Taub nut space. So it has a metric which looks like, in a sense, a product of two four-dimensional Taub nut spaces except twisted. So locally, it looks kind of like a product of two four-dimensional Taub nuts. So xi, so i and j run from one to two, and the x vector has three coordinates, so they parameterize in R6. If you had just, say, x1, then you would have exactly the four-dimensional Taub knot. So I won't write this out in its full glory, but this function u is some harmonic function. So this is a particular example of one of these toric hyperkähler manifolds. So I didn't tell you what A is because we're running out of time, but if I have a tiny bit of time at the end, I'll write it down. So if this U matrix was diagonal, then the space would decompose into a product of two independent Taub knots. Um, Taub knot space is, is, is something, just in case you don't know what it is, uh, I can think of R4 as an S1 vibration over R3. Basically, at <clears throat> so R R four in polar coordinates has an S three. So I th can think of R four as the cone over S three, and S three, as I hope you know, is can be described as a as a hop vibration of S one over S two. This is very very similar to the vibration of S seven over CP three that we wrote down explicitly before up there. Um, so S3 you can think of as an S1 fibered over S2, and so since R4 is the real cone over it, then R4 is some S1 vibration over S3, where the S1 shrinks at the origin. So at the origin in R3, this circle shrinks because the whole S3 shrinks. So this R3 consists of the S2 part of this, and the cone. So the cone over S2 is, of course, R3. 
And Taubnut space, just roughly, is a geometry very much like this, except that as you go to infinity in the radial direction, you keep the size of the circle constant. So it exactly just does the job that we wanted to do. This is um, an eight-dimensional generalization of that geometry. So here you have two circles, which both go to constant radii at infinity. So this thing has a, a U1 squared isometry and an SU2 R symmetry. And near the origin, you can show that it actually just looks like C4 mod ZK. So, so near, near the origin, it looks like C4 mod ZK. All we did is modify the asymptotics of the background so that these circles remain small. And then the nice thing about this is that if you put the black M2 brain in this geometry, sitting at the origin, then the circle that's associated to the coordinate alpha 2 um, is like the M theory. We will interpret it as the M theory circle. That's the one associated to this ZK quotient. And at infinity, its size remains finite. So if I reduce on that circle to type 2a, I get a background of type 2a where the string coupling is small everywhere. And I have a black M2 brain solution with a smooth near horizon limit. Um, so that really sounds like a, a background in which I should just know what the field theory is. And I can do a trick. I make a further T duality. So I have, I had this other small circle. I had two small circles. Well, two circles that remain finite. The other one associated to the alpha one direction in this geometry. And if I T dualize on that, it turns out that one obtains a configuration of D-brains in flat space. So you end up, so when you reduce from M theory to type 2a, you ended up with N D2 brands. And when you T dualize on that circle, you get N D3 brands. So you end up with N D3 brands, and the geometry is gone. So as you might know, if you have an NS5 brand and you T dualize transversely to an NS5 brain, it produces a Taub knot. And so since this geometry is very closely related to Taub knot, it shouldn't be a surprise, perhaps, that when you do this, you end up with an NS5 brain and a 1K5 brain. A 1K5 brain is the bound state of 1 NS5 brain and KD5 brains. Or you could also understand it a different way. In type 2B theory, so this is now a, a background in type 2B because I did a T-duality. In type 2B, there is an SL2Z uh, group of dualities. And under this SL2Z, I can transform this NS5 brain, transforms as you know, a usual two two vector of integers under SL2Z. And so this is one of the images of the NS5 brain under the SL2Z. I could also think of it as this kind of bound state. And if I look at this D brain configuration, it's actually possible to derive the N equals six field theory using known rules of how D3 brains, uh, the field theory on D3 brains in configurations with NS5 brains. Um, so one aspect is that when D3 brains end on NS5 brains, it doesn't break the gauge symmetry. It's like a Neumann boundary conditions for the gauge field. I mean, you could even think of, in this context, the NS5 brain as just being defined as a boundary condition for the N equals 4 super yang mills theory living on the D3 brain, in the same way that you define the D brains as boundary conditions for world sheet strings. Um, so anyway, the gauge field is unbroken on these D3 brains, so you end up with a UN gauge group and another UN gauge group, because these D3 brains end on the NS5 brains, and also on this object. At weak coupling, this is almost the same as an NS5 brain, in the sense that the NS5 brain is parametrically heavier than the D5 brain. So you end up with two gauge groups, and then there are bifundamental strings that stretch between the two broken pieces of the NS5 brain. So that's already looking quite similar to the quiver that I had written down at the beginning of the lecture, this, S, this UN times UN theory. Now we see it has one, two, one, two. So matter content like this. And then the only other thing is that what is the effect of this K? Yeah, I'll be done in one second. Uh, what is the effect of this K? So it's possible to show that in order to preserve N equals three supersymmetry in this configuration, you have to rotate this brain relative to that one. So transverse to the D3, there's an R6. 
and you have to rotate this brain relative to that one. That gives a mass to various scalars, so, which is associated to the n equals 3 churn simons term. And the churn simons term itself, you can see from some, in various ways, either by building this guy out of this kind of bound state and integrating out some fermions that are associated to the d5, d3 strings, or you can use some very simple argument which says that if I have a, if I start with a D3 brain ending on an NS5 brain, I have no churn Simons term. If I have a D3 brain ending on a 1K5 brain, I can perform an SL2Z duality, which takes it back to, so, so under SL2Z, this is equivalent to a D3 brain ending again on an NS5 brain, but now I've shifted the type 2B axion. So, the type 2B axiodiliton transforms in the usual way under SL2Z. So now I have a configuration with chi equal to k over, equal to 2 pi and k. And it's easy to, this thing corresponds to a coupling on the D3 world volume of a, a theta term, chi over 8 pi squared integral f wedge f. And if you integrate this by parts, it looks like a Chern-Simons term on the boundary. So this thing is the same as the integral on the boundary of the churn simons Lagrangian. And so if you plug this into here, you see that we get k over 4 pi times the churn simons Lagrangian, so actually the churn simons action. And it pairs up with these masses given to the matter fields, and you end up producing precisely this churn simons matter theory. Here it has still the Yang-Mills terms with n equals 3 supersymmetry, and in the infrared, it flows to the fixed point with n equals 6. So I guess that's it. <laughs>